Good evening. Thank you for coming. Um, also, as a reminder, for those that are taking this as a class, we're not going to go over the syllabus tonight. There will be an extra file for that later that you can listen to. Now, tonight we are pleased to welcome Dr. Andy Woods for our next intensive, uh, The Coming Millennial Kingdom. And Andy became a Christian at age 16. He graduated with high honors, earning two baccalaureate degrees in business administration and political science from the University of Redlands in California, and obtained a Juris Doctorate from Whittier Law School in California, and then he practiced law, taught business and law, and related courses at Citrus Community College in California, and served as an interim pastor of Rivera uh, First Baptist Church in Pico Rivera, California, from 1996 to 1998. In 1998, he began taking courses at Chafer and Talbot Theological Seminaries. He earned a Master of Theology theology degree with high honors in 2002 and a doctor of philosophy and Bible exposition in 2009 at Dallas Theological Seminary. In 2005 and 2009, he received the Donald K. Campbell Award for Excellence in Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary. Formerly a pastor of Bible and Theology at the College of Biblical Studies, Andy now serves as president of Chafer Theological Seminary and is senior pastor of Sugarland Bible Church. Andy has contributed to numerous theological journals and Christian books, which there's one right there, which I highly recommend, uh, which you'll be basing that off of for uh, the intensive. And he also has spoken on a variety of topics at Christian conferences. So now let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Andy Woods. <clears throat> All right, y'all. It's good to be here. Uh, let's take our Bibles, if we could, and uh, open them to the book of Genesis, <clears throat> chapter 1. We're uh, going to embark on a study on the coming kingdom. As he mentioned, I did write a, a book on this. It's sort of been a passion of mine for a while. And in this uh, opening lecture, we're going to try to cover um, the first two chapters of that book. And if you haven't read it, that's okay. Um, maybe this uh, series will give you an appetite to get that. Um, so let's um, take a look at three things in this opening session. Number one, uh, some quotes demonstrating that there's a lot of confusion on the kingdom. And then I'll give you sort of an outline that we're going to use as we march through this over nine sessions. And then I want to draw an important uh, distinction for you. So would you all say that there's a lot of confusion about the kingdom today in the evangelical world? Uh, the emergent church, Doug Pageant, said the kingdom of God is a central conversation in emerging communities. And let me tell you, kingdom of God language is really big in the emerging church. Brian uh, McLaren talks about how the role of Jesus was to bring in the kingdom, which I agree with. I just don't think he did it quite yet. Uh, another writer, Brian McLaren, same writer, actually says, Revelation is a book about the kingdom of God here and now. Russell Moore, have you heard of Russell Moore? Um, president of the Ethics and Religious Liberties Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention. He says, the locus of the kingdom of God in this age is within the church, where Jesus rules as king. As we live our lives together, we see the transforming power of the gospel and the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. Rick Warren says he will do whatever it takes to establish God's kingdom on the earth. 
So you kind of go through these quotes, and these are things that you hear today all the time. People say they're building the kingdom. They're bringing in the kingdom. Uh, books are being written called The Kingdom Man. Uh, <coughs> conferences are being held called Kingdom Builders. And so really the question becomes, does the Bible have anything to say about this? And... Um, Here's kind of an outline we're going to look at. Actually, we're not going to look at this whole outline. This is the organization of my book. book has basically three parts. Number one, what does the Bible say about the kingdom? And in that section, I take you, and that's where I'm going to be with you guys. I'm going to try to take you from Genesis to Revelation over nine lessons and show you what I think the Bible says about the kingdom. And we'll be tr making the case that the kingdom is not something that's here now. The kingdom is in a state of postponement, not cancellation, postponement. And I'll be showing you that from Genesis to Revelation. Part two of the book is, well then, if that's true, and the kingdom is postponed, and the kingdom is yet future, why do so many people believe that we're currently in the kingdom? So in that section, which unfortunately I'm not going to be able to cover, but it takes you through every passage that people use that argue that we're in the kingdom now. And then finally, part three is who cares? Why does it matter? Because the subtitle of the book, if I can backtrack just for a second, The coming kingdom, subtitle, what is kingdom, what is the kingdom, and how is kingdom now theology changing the focus of the church? And uh, I'm sort of of the opinion that if you think the church is the kingdom, it changes what the church is supposed to be. That's why I think Satan has always been at work trying to convince the church, really going back to Augustine uh, in the fourth century, that the church equals the kingdom. So I'm teaching this right now at my local church, and I'm up to, we just finished Wednesday night, the 73rd lesson. <laughs> so obviously I've got nine lessons with you guys, so I, had, I have to abbreviate. So we're only going to be able to cover part one. Uh, but if you get the, get the book, or if you, if you like watching videos and learning audio or visual, you can go to my website at Sugarland Bible Church. It's all there for you. Or my YouTube channel. Just type in Andy Woods, Pastor's Point of View, into your YouTube search engine and go to the Kingdom playlist. And we've been gradually uploading the lessons. So what is abbreviated here, you can get the full picture, A, in the book, or B, at those other sources. So what we're looking at in our nine sessions together is what does the Bible say about the kingdom? Isn't that a good place to start, the Bible? Would you all give me an amen on that? All right. And before we get into that, let me make an important distinction. This, that's what this chart is about here. There's a difference between the universal kingdom and the theocratic kingdom. What you discover when you go into the Bible and you start researching what God's Word says about the Bible is verses teach different things. Some verses, like Psalm 93, 1 and 2, teach that the kingdom is eternal. Other verses, like Daniel 2, verse 44, teach that the kingdom is completely future. Some verses teach that the kingdom is universal in scope. Other verses teach that it's earthly. Some verses, like Daniel 4, 17, teach that the kingdom is the direct rule of God. Other verses, like Psalm 2, verses 6 through 9, talk about how God is going to rule through a man. Some verses teach that the kingdom is always in existence. Psalm 93, 1 and 2. Other people say, no, the kingdom is conditioned on a human response of some kind. Like what Christ said to Israel, repent for the kingdom of heaven is what? At hand. 
So um, how do we handle these differences? Well, I think what the Bible reveals is there's two forms of the kingdom. There's a universal form, which is always in effect at all times. But then there's another phase of the kingdom, which we would call theocratic, which God is going to rule through a man. Now, the left side portion of the screen, uh, I'm not trying to argue that that is no longer in effect. The universal kingdom has always been here. God is always sovereign. He's always in control. He will always be sovereign. He will always be in control. What I'm trying to argue is the right-hand column, the theocratic kingdom, is what was lost to planet Earth through the sin of our forebears in Genesis 3. And so the goal of human history, as I'll try to demonstrate, is how that theocratic kingdom is going to be restored to the earth one day. In fact, I would say that's what the Bible is about. If you ask your average person, what is the Bible about, you'll get all kinds of different comments. Uh, I think the Bible is about the kingdom. It's about the challenge to the theocratic kingdom. Uh, God's authority was challenged in Genesis 3. Satan became the god of this age. And so the story of the Bible is how that kingdom that was established in Eden as God was going to rule through a man, the first Adam, is going to come back to the earth. So we're not dealing in this series with the universal kingdom. We're dealing completely with the theocratic kingdom, if that makes any sense. Because when I start talking about a postponed kingdom, people say, well, you don't believe God is sovereign today. Yes, I do. Because the universal kingdom is intact. What, what is challenged was the theocratic kingdom. So hopefully that, that makes sense. So with all of that being said, since we're trying to look at what does the Bible say about the theocratic kingdom, um, I've sort of divided these um, segments into nine parts because I get nine sessions with you. And if you're patient and you walk with me through these nine sections, uh, you're going to come away from this intensive understanding the big picture of the Bible concerning the theocratic kingdom. So those nine parts are, number one, we're going to start in the Garden of Eden. And we're going to see what God tried to set up that got lost. And then we're going to move from there to the Abrahamic covenant. And then in section three, we'll introduce the Mosaic covenant. And in session four, I'll talk about how the theocracy was sort of uh, restored in a limited sense at the time of Moses. But that theocracy was lost when uh, the Shekinah glory of God left the temple in the days of Ezekiel. And then we'll look at section number five, how the Old Testament prophets kind of held out the theocratic kingdom as a hope for the human race. And they give a tremendous portrait of what the world is going to be like one day once this theocratic kingdom is restored. And then in number six, we're going to look at how that kingdom in the time of Jesus was offered to Israel on a silver platter. It's called the offer of the kingdom. And the nation of Israel turned down the offer. And so since the kingdom is in a state of postponement, we have to ask ourselves in session seven, well, what is God doing then in the present while the theocratic kingdom is not here? So we'll be looking at the Matthew 13 parables, which fill that out for us. And then in number eight, we'll be looking at the church. That's us, right? And see, that's the confusion is people think the church is the kingdom and the kingdom is the church. And I'll try to show you there in session number eight that the church is a wonderful work of God. Uh, I'm very happy to be living in this time period that we're living in where we're part of the body of Christ, where God is clearly at work and people are getting saved. But that's not the kingdom, and that's the confusion. Everybody today is trying to argue the church age is the kingdom age. And I'm going to try to demonstrate that it's not. 
And then finally, in the last session, I'll be describing what, what then is God finally going to do subsequent to the rapture of the church when he brings his kingdom to the earth. How exactly is he going to do that? So does that help in terms of where we're going? So let's start in the Garden of Eden. Take a look at Genesis 1. And notice, if you will, verses 26 through 28. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them, what's the next word there? Rule. Doesn't that sound like kingdom language? Let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over all the earth, and of every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. See that? Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and of over every living thing that moves on the earth. When you go to Genesis 2, 19 and 20, it says... Out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle, to all the birds of the sky, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So you notice here, right at the beginning of the Bible, God established the kingdom, the theocratic kingdom. God was going to rule through a man. Alongside the man would be his wife. And their whole function was to govern creation, not for themselves, but for who? For God, and that's the theocratic kingdom. That's God's original intent for the human race. And you see that amplified in Genesis 2 when God brings to man the animals and lets him name the animals. Now, when you go through the Bible, what you'll discover is naming something is very significant. When you name something, you have authority over it. So God names things in Genesis 1, showing his authority over creation. Uh, you might remember in the time of Daniel. Remember what Nebuchadnezzar did? How he brought uh, the nation of Israel and uh, Judah into captivity. And remember the first thing Nebuchadnezzar did? He, he renamed Daniel and his three friends. You remember that? Uh, Daniel's name was changed to what uh, uh, Belshazzar, and then th the, his three friends were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Those were their Hebrew names. By the way, each of their Hebrew names was reflecting a different aspect of God's character, showing that these Hebrew youths, you know, had been reared in godly homes. But when they got under Nebuchadnezzar's control, what did Nebuchadnezzar do? He gave them Babylonian names. And what are the three Babylonian names? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. See, we know those names, but for some reason we don't know Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So when Nebuchadnezzar renamed them, he was asserting his sovereignty over them. You see that? And so the rest of the book of Daniel is God saying, you think you're in charge, Nebuchadnezzar? No, you're not, and I'll prove it to you in 12 chapters. <laughs> So when someone names something in the Bible, it's very significant because it's demonstrating authority. God is giving a person authority over to what he is naming. So when the animals are brought to Adam and he's given the authority to name them, that's all part of the kingdom in a theocratic sense where God was giving Adam authority to reign over the creation that God had set up. And so that is the beginning of the kingdom. So the theocratic kingdom is God reigning over a man alongside of his wife and the two of them. By the way, Adam and Eve were joint rulers. 
Because when you go back to Genesis 1, 26 and 27, it says God said to them, subdue the earth. Now, I believe in male headship, absolutely. But the authority was actually given to both of them with the man you know, retaining the authority in the marriage. But the, the ruling, the assignment was given to both of them because it says God said to them, rule and subdue. So that is the beginning of the kingdom. And this was God's original intention for the human race. And Genesis 1 and 2 is followed by Genesis 3. So what happened in Genesis 3? Take a look at Genesis 3. Notice verses 11 through 13. Where now our forebears aren't ruling creation for God. They're listening to creation. And one of the voices they're listening to is a talking snake, right? Subsequent scripture defines that talking snake as who? Satan. So they listened to the voice of creation and rebelled against God. And look at what it says here in Genesis 3, verses 11 through 13. He said, God speaking to Adam and Eve, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I have commanded you not to eat? The man said, look at this, guys, the woman you gave to me. She gave me from the tree and I ate. So it's not my fault, Lord. It's the woman's fault. And it's really not even her fault. It's your fault because you're the one that gave me the woman and she messed everything up. So he's not really taking responsibility for his family, is he? And then you look at verse 13. Uh, and it says, Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the serpent. And as the joke goes, the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> but you see what's happened here? There's been a perversion of the original design of God. The original design of God is for Adam and Eve to rule creation for God. And that's not what's happening here. What's happening here is they're listening to the voice of creation and rebelling against God. Eve is not governing the serpent. She's listening to the serpent. Adam is not exercising authority in the marriage, but he's listening to the voice of his wife. And so everything that God intended got perverted from, from the bottom up. And so what happened? The theocratic kingdom disappeared from the earth. And who became the ruler of this world? Satan. Satan. And if you look at all of these passages I have there on the screen, um, that's why the Bible calls Satan the prince of this world, the god of this age, the prince and power of the air, the one who the believer wrestles with, He's roaming about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The whole world lies in the lap of the wicked one. So this is how Satan usurped authority over the earth, and the theocratic kingdom was lost. The universal kingdom is always here, but we're not dealing with that in this study. We're dealing with the theocratic kingdom, where God the Father rules over a man alongside of his wife, and they govern creation for God. So once you understand what was designed and what was lost, then you start to see what the goal of human history is. The goal of human history is to restore what got lost. The goal of human history is for God the Father to rule over a man. Now this time it won't be the first Adam he'll rule over, but he'll rule over the who? The last Adam, Jesus Christ. And he, along with his wife, will govern creation for God for a thousand years in the millennial kingdom. Now, the la if the last Adam is Jesus, who do you think his wife is? Church. That's us. Thank you, Ed. That's us. We're the bride of Christ. So we're being prepared for our kingdom role for the thousand years. So everything that's happening in your life right now as a Christian is preparatory for that. 
Uh, one person put it this way, this life is training ground, training time for reigning time. Even the, even the trials that we go through as believers, they're all providentially designed by God to prepare us for that kingdom role. And God cannot allow this earth to go out of existence until what was lost in Eden is restored in the thousand years. That's why, that's why the whole Bible is moving us to that thousand year time period. So I don't know, you watch these science fiction movies today about the earth exploding and disappearing and all these kinds of things. Well, biblically that can't happen because if the earth disappears before what was lost in Eden gets reasserted, then God loses. You see that? If you look for just a minute, I don't have it on the screen, but if you look for just a minute at Genesis 8.22, in what's called the Noahic Covenant, God says, While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. In other words, the earth is going to go through natural cycles. He describes here four cycles. Seed time harvest, summer, winter, day and night. Now this isn't very politically correct here. He describes cold and heat. You mean the earth is going to go through natural cycles of heating and cooling that don't have anything to do with my SUV? And that's what the Bible says. Because God is going to allow the earth to go through these cycles so it's preserved. Because if the earth goes out of existence before the office of the theocratic administrator is restored, God loses. See that? So Charles Ryrie uh, asked this question. Why is an earthly kingdom necessary? That's what we're studying in this intensive, the, earth, the coming kingdom of, of Christ. Why, why do we need an earthly kingdom? Did he, that's Jesus, not receive his inheritance when he was raised and exalted in heaven? Is not his present rule his inheritance? Why does there need to be an earthly kingdom? See, if I was a covenant theologian, reform theologian, replacement theologian, amillennialist, I would basically be telling you that what Jesus has right now at the right hand of the Father is sufficient. But our line of thinking is what Jesus has at the right hand of the Father, where he's functioning not as king, but as high priest after the order of Melchizedek, is wonderful, but it's not enough. Because it doesn't restore what was lost. In order to restore what was lost, you have to have a direct presence of Jesus under the authority of God the Father, ruling over the earth, just as literally as Adam, along with his wife, under the authority of God the Father, prior to Genesis 3, was ruling planet earth, you know, subduing, naming the animals. And so that structure has to be brought back. And if it's not brought back, then God loses. So I guess my point is your doctrine of a coming kingdom, you know, you ask people to defend their view of the coming kingdom. Did you, did you all ever know Harold Honer? Longtime professor at Dallas Seminary, and he would ask students on their oral exams, defend their doctrine of the coming kingdom. And the students would all jump to Revelation 20. And he would say, well, can you go earlier in the Bible to defend it? And they would get nervous and say, well, let's see, Paul talked about it. Well, can you go earlier in the Bible? Well, Jesus talked about it. Yeah, but can you go earlier in the Bible? Well, the prophets talked about it. Can you go earlier in the Bible? Well, it's in the covenants. Yeah, but go earlier in the Bible. And he's driving the students back to Genesis 1, Genesis 2. Because if you understand Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, you see why there has to be an earthly kingdom. So Charles Ryrie asks, is not his present rule his inheritance? Why does there need to be an earthly kingdom? Here's the answer. Because he must be triumphant in the same arena where he was seemingly defeated. Right now, Jesus at the right hand of the Father is not triumphant in the same arena. 
It's in heaven. His authority has to be reasserted over the earth. His rejection was by the rulers of this world, was on this earth. Therefore, his exaltation must be on this earth. And so it shall be when he comes again to rule the world in righteousness. He has waited long for his inheritance. Soon he shall receive it. This is why we believe in a coming earthly kingdom. There has to be. Uh, J. Dwight Pentecost, in his book, uh, Thy Kingdom Come, says basically the same thing. He says, apart from the reign of Christ here on earth, and apart from this rule, God's purpose for man could never be brought to a conclusion. God's purpose for the earth would be unrealized. And the problem generated by Satan's rebellion would never be resolved. Thus, the physical, literal reign of Christ on earth is a theological and biblical necessity. See that? Unless Satan is victorious over God. What was lost in Eden has to be restored. Uh, Mark Hitchcock, in his book, The End, says this. Johann Sebastian Bach sometimes slept more than he should have. His children had a unique way of waking him up. Um, then we, uh, they, let's see, then we go to the piano and begin to play a composition. When they, get, when they got to the last note, they would stop. They wouldn't play the last note. It worked like a charm, and it would always wake him up. He would get up from his sleep and go to the piano and play the final chord. He couldn't stand to leave it hanging there incomplete and unfinished. Isn't that interesting? In the same way today, we are all waiting for the last note on the final page of God's Song of Victory. God will not leave his grand composition without striking the final note. That final note is the messianic kingdom of Jesus Christ. And so it's a wonderful thing to think about, and you're part of it as the bride, and I'm part of it as well. So where does the kingdom start? I mean, the whole kingdom concept starts with your understanding of Eden and what was lost. So the coming kingdom, um, that's really the, what the first two chapters of my book are about. And then we get into chapter three of the book which is the second thing that we're looking at out of nine big ticket subject items. We talked about Eden. And then you start to build your doctrine of a coming kingdom, not only from Eden, but you start to build it from what is called the Abrahamic covenant. So here's some things we want to think about as we talk about the Abrahamic covenant. First of all, why do we need an Abrahamic covenant? You remember Genesis 3, verse 15, right after the fall of man? Remember what God said? I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. So right here, after the fall of man, at the dawn of human history, Satan is put on notice, the serpent, that there's coming one from the seed of the woman. Who would the woman be? It would be Eve. There's coming one from her seed or lineage who's going to do what to Satan's head? Crush it. Now, along the way, Satan is going to be allowed to bruise the heel of this coming one. In other words, he's going to be able to inflict some damage to him of a temporary nature along the way. But ultimately, who's going to win? The seed of the woman is going to win because he's going to do what to Satan's head? Crush it. If you had your choice, would you rather have your heel bruised or your head crushed? I'd take the heel. Because if my head's crushed, I'm dead. It's over. So the, the prophecy, and this is your first messianic prophecy about Jesus in the whole Bible. 
that there's going to come one from the seed of the woman who is going to defeat Satan. And so that's why in early Genesis you have a genealogy which traces Adam and the promise through Seth, through Noah, through Shem, and ultimately right down to a man named Terah. In fact, if you look at Genesis 11 and verse 31, you'll see who Terah is. Terah took Abram, his son. So Terah is whose father? A man whose name was Abram, destined to become Abraham. So why all of this uh, tracing of this genealogy? I mean, it goes from Adam to Seth to Noah. Now, how many sons does Noah have? Three, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And it traces that lineage right through Shem. By the way, from the word Shem, we get Semitic. That's where the name Semitic comes from. And so it's going to be through the Semitic people groups that this Messiah is going to come. And then because it traces the lineage from there to Terah, uh, that's where we learn that this lineage is going to come through Abraham's descendants. And so God therefore starts a special nation through this man Abram. And that nation would eventually become to be known as the nation of Israel. And the fulfillment of Genesis 3 verse 15, the crushing of the serpent's head, is going to be through someone coming from the lineage of Israel. So why did God have to, and that's what God is doing in Genesis 12. He's starting a brand new nation. So why does God have to start a brand new nation? Why didn't he just use an existing nation? Well, the answer is in Genesis 11. Genesis 11 is the tower of Babel. Take a look at Genesis 11. Notice, if you will, verses 1 through 9. It says, Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words, and it came about as they journeyed east. They found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. By the way, Shinar is in an area that is called also Mesopotamia. Do you recognize the word Potomac? We have a Potomac River, don't we, in the United States? Potamia means rivers. Meso means middle. Mesopotamia is in the middle of the rivers. What two rivers would those be? The Euphrates and the Tigris. Today that's called modern-day Iraq. And we learn here that... The Tower of Babel, the first attempt at a United Nations conference, if I could put it that way, man's first attempt at world government originated in that part of the world. They said, come one another, come let us make bricks, let us burn them thoroughly, and they used brick for stone, and they used tar for mortar. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. Let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered abroad over the face of the entire earth. You'll notice there in verse 1 that at one time in human history, there was only one language on planet earth. There weren't multiple languages. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do, and now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. In other words, the potential for evil is unparalleled if there's only one government on the face of the earth. I mean, think if that government fell into the hands of an Adolf Hitler. There'd be no checks and balances to stop evil. So God says, come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel. Now, uh, in Hebrew, Bab, B-A-B, means gate, and El means God. 
So this was literally a gateway to the gods. That's why they're building this tower into heaven. To quote those great theologians, Led Zeppelin, they were building a stairway to heaven. So it's sort of a play on words. Uh, because God confused the language, they couldn't talk to one another. We call that babbling today. But Babel also means gate of the gods. Because they were trying to build a one world political, economic, and religious system that excluded God. That's what's called the, the New World Order, right? Uh, therefore, the name was called Babel. Therefore, the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. From, and then from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. See, all of this is happening in Genesis 11 before you have the calling of Abraham in Genesis 12. You can't understand what's going on in Genesis 12 until you understand what's happening in Genesis 11, right? Because Genesis 11 comes before Genesis 12. You all agree with me on that? See, that's cutting-edge stuff you're getting here at this intensive. <laughs> you're going to go home tonight, and what did you learn? Well, I learned Genesis 11 came before Genesis 12. What was happening at the Tower of, of Babel, and I get this from the book The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop, based on his study of... Babylonian tradition is something was happening called the worship of the mother and the child. Nimrod, whose name means rebellion, was married to, a, and he's mentioned in the Bible, Genesis 10, 8 through 10. He was married to a woman named Samarimus, and the two of them had a child named Tammuz. Tammuz was killed by a wild animal and was miraculously brought back to life through satanic powers, according to Alexander Hislop. And so what started happening at the Tower of Babel, according to Alexander Hislop, was the worship of the mother and the child. That was a religious system that was already in place there. So when God disrupted the language and people scattered and went their own different ways and began to form different nations, what did they take with them? The mother-child system. You, and Hislop's point is you can find the mother-child system in every culture. It's just the names are changed from place to place. In Assyria, the mother is called Ishtar, which, by the way, is where we get the word Easter. I can't find Easter in the Bible, can you? I find Resurrection Sunday in the Bible. But what about all this stuff about bunnies and eggs? That's part of this Babylonian system. In Phoenicia, the mother is called Astarte. The child is called Baal. In Egypt, the mother is called Isis. The child is called Horus. In Greece, the mother is called Aphrodite. The child is called Eros. Now, I ruined Easter. Now, we're going to ruin Valentine's Day. In Rome, the mother is called Venus. The child is called Cupid. And you can see the different names given in Asia, India. Now, now look at this. Alexander Hislop was no fan of Roman Catholicism because he says the mother-child system in, in Roman Catholicism is the mother-child system of the Tower of Babel. It's just they got the names Jesus and Mary. I mean, we all know that the Jesus and Mary of Roman Catholicism is not the Jesus and Mary of the Bible, right? The, the Mary in Roman Catholicism is a perpetual virgin. That's not what the Bible says. What the Bible says is Joseph and Mary uh, had a normal relationship after the virgin conception. And Jesus had many half-brothers. Two of them wrote New Testament books, right? James and Jude. The, the, the Mary of Roman Catholicism is someone you pray to. Are we supposed to pray to saints? We're not supposed to do that. The Jesus of Roman Catholicism is a Jesus who says, I did 95%. Now you kick in the remaining 5% to be justified. So what do you have to do? You've got to pay, pray, and obey. 
So it's a work system. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, Jesus says, it is what? Finished. And then the mother-child system over the course of time went into the borders of Israel. And you'll find some references to that there at the bottom of the screen. Jeremiah 7, Jeremiah 44, Ezekiel 8. That's why God was so angry with Israel because she had become just like the other nations. And that's why she was sent into the 70-year Babylonian captivity to rid her of that mother-child system. So what is my point? <clears throat> my point is when God sat down to figure out what nation he's going to use to channel Genesis 3 verse 15 and the blessings promised through that nation to the world and bring his kingdom to the earth, he couldn't use Assyria. Why is that? Because Assyria owes her roots to Babel, and she's been corrupted by the mother-child system. You following me? He couldn't use Phoenicia. Because Phoenicia owes her roots to the Tower of Babel, and she's corrupted by the mother-child system. He couldn't use Greece. He couldn't use Rome. He couldn't use any other civilization. So what does God have to do? He has to do what? He's got to start a brand new nation. And that nation would be called the nation of Israel. And the patriarch of the nation of Israel would be the patriarch who? Abram, whose name would later be changed to Abraham. So Abraham, Genesis 12, was an idolater originally. You'll find a reference to that. In Joshua 24, verses 22 and 23, he was corrupted by that same system. And so God now calls him out from where he's living in the Ur of the Chaldeans, tells, tells him to walk by faith, and begins the walk of sanctification where he separates him. And why is God doing that? Because he's, he's making a brand new nation from this man Abram. And he's going to give him a ton of promises. And why is God doing that? Because he has to have a nation through which to bring to the world the fulfillment of Genesis 3, verse 15. He can't use the other nations because they've all been corrupted by the idolatrous mother-child system. And so that's why the calling of Abram is such a big deal uh, in terms of understanding the progress of God as far as bringing the kingdom to the earth.